Good morning. Thanks for being here. Our emergency management team, along with many others across the state, continue to watch Tropical Depression Debbie while also responding to ongoing rain and previous flooding throughout the state. Let's start with Debbie. The good news is it appears to be tracking westerly and Vermont is no longer in the eye of the storm, but it will impact the western side of the state later today and the vast majority of Vermont. Now, even though we don't expect to see as much damage as we once did from this storm, there's still going to be challenges, especially in the Northeast Kingdom, after many areas saw significant rainfall over the last 30 days. To prepare, we amended the state of emergency to include Debbie, like we did in preparation for the July 11th storm. This allowed us to bring out-of-state resources, like swift water teams, to help with our response efforts, if needed. As well, they're now staged to assist neighboring states if their needs are greater. Commissioner Morrison will go into more details, but we want to remind folks to be smart and safe. Please, don't drive through flooded waters. As we've seen in pictures from the July flood, Sometimes there is no road under what appears to be a small amount of water over the pavement. And make sure you're signed up for VT Alert to stay up to date on road closures and other notifications. You can sign up at vem.vermont.gov slash VT Alert. Finally, if you're in immediate danger or see someone who is, call 911. Over the last few weeks, I've been visiting flooded communities, inspecting damage, and talking with those impacted to understand what their needs are and how we can help. While we're waiting to hear back from the President on our major disaster declaration, which if approved, will bring federal assistance for individuals and municipalities, we're taking some immediate steps at the state level. At our emergency board meeting yesterday, made up of four legislators and myself as chair, we approved additional funds for the Business Emergency Grant Assistance Program, or BGAP, to provide funding for businesses to help with immediate repairs so they can get their doors open back up and get people back to work. Secretary Curley will talk more about this in a minute. And as I mentioned last week, I continue to be concerned about the number of homes that have been destroyed adding to a housing crisis we face for years. In 2023, there were 16 homes FEMA identified as destroyed and 44 mobile homes condemned. So far in 2024, preliminary data shows 26 homes destroyed and 121 with major damage. And because of our housing crisis, it's difficult to find a place for these families to go. With our urgent needs in mind, we had a boots on the ground team from multiple agencies and departments work on a plan to add housing quickly and affordably by putting new mobile home units into vacant lots in existing mobile home communities. With the funding approved by the emergency board yesterday, a rapid response mobile home infill initiative will be put on a fast track. This program will take existing vacant mobile home lots identified by the task team, complete the site work to make them usable, then order and replace energy efficient mobile homes on the lots and connect those in need to these homes for them to purchase. Our plan is to place 30 mobile homes by the end of the calendar year and as many as 100 by the end of the fiscal year helping us to address the urgent need for affordable housing, especially in flood impacted counties. With the support of emergency board members, we were able to expedite this work by appropriating $7 million to this effort. I also signed an, an addendum to the existing executive order, which waives certain regulatory requirements to help expedite this work. With that, I'll turn over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. 
Today, I'm going to report out on several items, including the expected impacts from the storm named Debbie, steps we have taken to prepare for more rain, and life safety reminders as we head into the weekend. I will then provide an update on a couple of items related to the previous storms of July 10th and July 30th. But first, let's discuss the weather. As the governor mentioned, in addition to last night's rain, we expect more rain across the state today. In some areas, particularly those where thunderstorms develop, we expect heavy rains. We anticipate sustained winds of 20 to 30 miles per hour with gusts up to 50 miles per hour. And there is a potential for isolated brief tornadoes, mostly in southern Vermont. It is highly likely that there will be power outages in areas across the state. While the forecast has improved slightly, it is important to note that we will have impacts from this weather system. The ground is oversaturated in many areas, and the risk for flooding, both flash flooding and river and stream flooding, is real. There have been sharp rises in the Mad and Winooski rivers, and we expect sharp rises in streams and brooks to include the Otter Creek. Early this morning, the Pasumpsic River was at flood stage in East Haven. There have been multiple reports of standing water in roadways. This creates dangerous driving conditions with risks of hydroplaning and obscured visibility. The governor mentioned that this week we amended the open state of emergency to include impacts from Debbie. This will allow us to access guard resources such as high water vehicles if they are needed as well as Emergency Management Assistance Compact, or EMAC, resources, such as out-of-state Swiftwater teams. We have also submitted an emergency declaration request to FEMA, which gives us access to federal resources, such as urban search and rescue teams. We have staged Swiftwater rescue teams across the state and we will monitor conditions and move resources as necessary until Debbie is passed. I want to talk a minute about what you should be doing. Pay attention to the weather and be prepared for the worst case scenario. Charge your flashlights and your cell phones. Please remember that the worst of the rain could come after dark. Remain vigilant until the storm has passed you by. Follow the directions of your local officials and emergency responders. Never drive through standing water and don't take unnecessary chances. Turn around, don't drown. We have emergency crews staged across the state, but please do not create a situation where you have to be rescued. Please don't put first responders at unnecessary risk. Understand your risks based on where you live. What do I mean by that? I mean, pay attention to the local conditions, hyper-local conditions. Debbie is gonna hit differently depending on where you are in Vermont. An example of what I mean is, if you live in an area that has oversaturated soil and high winds come through, there is an increased risk of trees toppling over particularly trees with shallow root systems. Another example is this. In some areas, river or stream banks have been eroded, and water may run in atypical and unexpected ways. Please don't count on the water running the way it normally does, and keep your heads up if you are near a river, stream, or brook. If you believe your situation could become unsafe, pack a go bag and have a plan in case you have to leave your home. If your situation becomes life-threatening, call 911 and follow the advice of emergency responders. I wanna go backwards to the July 30th storm for a minute. Just a word about damage reports from the weather events of July 29th through the 31st. 
This is a reminder that even if you fixed your own damage or you just haven't gotten around to reporting the damage, we strongly encourage you to connect with 211 so that we have an accurate assessment of the damage across the state. Every report helps us move closer to the thresholds that might trigger federal assistance. So please help your neighbors and fellow Vermonters by documenting your damage on 211. You can go online at vermont211.org or call 211. FEMA and State of Vermont teams have been in the field this week looking at the damage that has been reported. To date, 211 has received reports of damage to 398 homes and zero businesses from the July 30th storms. We suspect that there is more damage out there and we are asking for your help in identifying it. As previously reported, we have submitted a request to the President for a major disaster declaration for the storms on July 10th. For that storm, 211 has received 2,575 reports of residential damage and 294 reports of damage to businesses. If we receive the declaration, it will open up avenues for significant federal assistance. We will update you with details once we have heard back from the White House. For today, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Stay safe, Vermont. While Debbie is not packing as big a punch as we anticipated, it will impact us. There will be damage. There will be various types of flooding. It will be a challenging next 18 hours, but we will get through it. Stay safe and take care of each other. And with that, I will turn things over to Secretary Joe Flynn from the Agency of Transportation. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning. I'm going to update on the current situation of state roads, bridges, rail, transit, and aviation. This morning, we still have two roads that remain closed from both the 10th and the 30th of July storms. And they are Route 5 in Barnet and Route 111 at the intersection of Route 114 on the Brighton Morgan line. All active freight rail and passenger rail is operating normally. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail does have three closure sections, two due to barrel and one due to the July 30th. Those sections are Danville Village Trailhead to the West Danville Park and Ride the Hardwick Trailhead to the Wolcott Trailhead and between St. Johnsbury and Marty's Store in Danville. There are currently no impacts to aviation and there are no impacts to transit. Last night, no new work that has been previously done has been affected by the rain overnight to our knowledge. I'm speaking specifically on the state network, but we haven't yet heard from towns. <clears throat> Yesterday, a dozen towns reached out for sandbags. And overnight, on Vermont Route 2 at the intersection of 18 in Waterford, there was a mudslide onto Route 2, US Route 2, excuse me. We are now clearing that mudslide. That concludes the report on roads and bridges, and I would turn this over to Secretary Lindsey Curley of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Flynn. As Governor Scott mentioned, yesterday the Emergency Board signed off on administration requests for flood-related funding for two programs run by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Rapid Response Mobile Home Infill Program and BGAP, 
first, I'd like to talk about the Rapid Response Mobile Home Infill Program, a cross-agency effort that will be overseen by the Department, in, the Department of Housing and Community Development. As you've heard us say countless times, Vermont is in the throes of a housing crisis that is decades in the making. Losing units to flooding and other natural disasters makes the problem even more acute. The Rapid Response Mobile Home Infill Program will address the urgent need for affordable housing exacerbated by natural disasters. The e-board yesterday signed off on transferring $7 million to the Rapid Response Mobile Home Infill, Infill Program, an innovative and efficient effort to make it easier for Vermonters to buy an affordable home. The program will streamline processes and leverage state resources to place mobile homes quickly and efficiently. We'll do this by identifying mobile home lots subsidizing site improvements to reduce the financial burden on homeowners, encouraging mobile home production, and offering support services to connect low-income homeowners, home buyers, with permanent housing options. Efforts by the Agency of Transportation, the Vermont State Housing Authority, and mobile home communities will ensure rapid site improvements and the placement of affordable, energy efficient mobile homes. Our goal is to help provide 250 new mobile homes to Vermonters over the next few years. As the governor said, starting with 30 homes by the end of this year. Every new unit across Vermont is a win. And by adding these new owner occupied mobile homes to the mix, it could make it easier for other Vermonters to find a place to own or rent. This is just one tool in the toolbox to increase housing opportunities and help flood victims, but we are confident that it will make a difference and help families stay in their communities. The other request by the Scott administration approved yesterday by the e-board was for funds to help businesses, farms, and nonprofits that suffered physical damages in this July's floods. The Department of Economic Development will distribute that money in the form of grants issued by the Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program, or what we call BGAP. To refresh your memory, BGAP first went live last August to help businesses, farms, and nonprofits that suffered physical damage in the 2023 summer floods. The then $20 million program helped 532 properties with an average grant of $36,500. Now, BGAP is set to help more organizations, with $7 million approved yesterday by the e-board and $5 million approved in the last legislative session. That's a $12 million total investment in repairing property, helping organizations reopen their doors, and getting Vermonters back to work. As we speak, the Department of Economic Development is working out the details to bring BGAP back online. But I can tell you that the $7 million approved yesterday will go to help businesses, farms, and nonprofits that suffered losses in July of 2024. The $5 million allocated during the legislative session will go to businesses, farms, and nonprofits with lingering unmet needs from the July 2023 floods. We will keep you updated as BGAP details are finalized. There will be some differences from the first iteration of BGAP, but the basic formula will be the same. BGAP will pay up to 30% of net physical damages. That damage not covered by insurance proceeds or fundraising. The latest numbers from Vermont 211 show that 294 businesses were damaged by flooding last month. We know this $7 million won't make those organizations whole, but it surely will help them in their recovery. As we did last summer, we are working with the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, which will be providing applicants with technical assistance, like helping them fill out applications or obtaining translation services. The Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation will take calls from businesses, farms, and nonprofits throughout Vermont that need help 
and either provide that assistance themselves or connect them with another regional development corporation to provide that service. Vermont's regional development corporations are invaluable partners in this effort. We encourage flood damaged organizations to use them as resources. I want to finish by thanking the lawmakers who sit on the emergency board, Senators Jane Kitchell and Ann Cummings, as well as Representatives Landfair and Kornheiser for supporting BGAP and the rapid response mobile home and fill program. These two programs will help Vermonters access stable housing and jobs, and they will strengthen Vermont's recovery as we face more frequent weather-related disasters. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary Curley. We'll now open it up to questions. Um, I'm curious where you're thinking about citing some of these uh, new mobile homes. Um, what we found, and, um, and some legislators have found this as well, uh, that there were about 200 open vacant lots throughout Vermont uh, that, uh, that just lacked a mobile home to put on them. So um, that's where we started. And we are looking at areas uh, that, uh, that are in flood impacted um, communities uh, that, uh, that would need the housing. So uh, they're throughout the state, uh, but we're really focusing on, at first, focusing on those areas where there's the greatest need. And it's probably an obvious question, but I assume these are mobile home lots that are you know, high and dry, completely out of the floodplain. They are. And I might have uh, either Stacy or, or Stacy, I'm sorry, yeah. Stacy or Mike sure. come up. Absolutely. Stacey. Great. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, most of the, uh, all of the lots that we're looking at are within existing uh, registered mobile home uh, communities throughout the state of Vermont. Uh, and as we go to assess the conditions of those lots, we'll ensure that they're out of the floodplain and uh, high and dry, as you said. Stacy, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm Stacy Andre. I'm with the Agency of Transportation. I am one of the Mobile Home uh, Task Team Rapid Response co chairs, along with uh, Michael Booth, who is also with the Agency of Transportation and a co chair. And how do you spell that last name? Andre, A N D R E. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And Stacy and Mike's um, input on this has been in invaluable. Uh, they've uh, they've really led this effort. And when I said we had uh, people from different departments and agencies, uh, there's just a couple, but uh, they were integral to the success of this program. With the storms today, Commissioner Morrison mentioned that the Pacific's already at flood stage levels. I guess where do the other rivers, whether it's Little Moyle, the Winooski, kind of stand around the state if we know that? Yeah, um, maybe Eric, maybe Eric could answer part of that. But uh, but again, the Pasumsek is one that we were watching, but also the Mad River, uh, Winooski, Lamoille, all the the typical ones that we've seen over the last few months. But um, but certainly Pasumsek, I think, has come up uh, significantly because of the huge amount of rain in the Caledonia area, Northeast Kingdom. And we're keeping an eye on all the rivers that normally give us. Um, conditions to worry about, but at this time it looks like they'll mostly only get to action level, um, but that depends on how much rain we get tonight. Uh, they're forecasting one to three, so it depends on if it stays in that range or not, but we'll, at the SEOC, we'll be watching those very closely. Last year was it twenty million dollars? It was total for and sorry for not being at the e board meeting yesterday, but seven million this year. Is that proportional based on damages assessed this year or just 
money. Yeah, Secretary Curley can go into more detail, but um, but it was based on the amount of damage we were seeing. We tried to replicate what we uh, we use, uh, and it wasn't enough, to be honest with you. Twenty million wasn't enough. Seven million is not going to be enough either. Uh, but it, it was to fill those gaps, help some of the smaller businesses uh, get their doors back open, and um, it was reflective of the twenty million uh, that we utilized a year ago. Yeah, um, yeah, um, absolutely. We we did look at it and and took a percentage of based on last year and tried to estimate as best as we could because early on it's early still, right? And so folks are still mucking and gutting and really well. Hopefully they've done that by now, but they're trying to assess what the cost is going to be. So we um, have also put out a survey to try to get an idea, a better feel for it. Because when folks are reporting into 211, they don't necessarily at that time have a dollar value to give. So we had to go out and do a little bit more um, research to, to get a number. But we're feeling pretty good. Like the governor said, it's not going to make anybody whole. But we feel um, compared to last year, based on what folks are reporting, that at least right now, um, we've provided for folks to get a similar um, award percentage-wise as we did a year ago. And is, is there any flexibility, like, do you foresee that number maybe going up before the legislative session, or is that, that it until January, do you think the session is um, It's hard to say what's going to happen in the next, you know, the, these storms. Um, but we've really, the other thing that happened was, um, you know, at the end of the last session, there was a contingency that you might have heard me refer to this other five million. Mm -hmm. There was five million that was uh, approved for flood-related um, impacts, and it wasn't. Um, you know, the, the intent of the legislation was clear to continue to help. There were folks in 2023 that were that that were not helped because. Um, the funds ran out as well as people came in too late, like after the program had ended and the funds were, were out. So it was intended to help them, but also others that um, still hadn't received you know, enough help. And um, so there's a little bit of flexibility there. So I, I hope we've hit the mark here and that we don't have to go back. But again, we like everything that we do, we'll just keep monitoring and um, work through things as as they unfold, um, but yeah, right now we're we're really hoping, like last time, that we have have calculated as best we can and 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 do this the right way right now. Kind of completely switching topics. Um, Tuesday, primary day, the lieutenant governor's race is one that is pretty interesting to me. Yeah, John Rogers and Gregory Thayer and your Republican Party that are both running for that. I guess, what do you make of both of them? Both of? Gregory Thayer and um, John Rogers running for lieutenant governor. Yeah, I've, uh, I've said publicly that uh, I'll be voting for John Rogers. I think he more aligns with uh, what my thoughts are, my vision, and, uh, and my outlook. So, um, but it is an interesting race. In the presidential election, have you uh, made a decision about who you will be likely voting for? I have, have not at this point, uh, but I have said repeatedly it will not be former President Trump. What do you make of um, Governor Tim Walz being the VP back to um, You know, I've, I've been advocating uh, all along. I, I have said that uh, I would probably not vote for another president who hadn't served in some executive branch being a former governor. Uh, and I've made it known um, there was some that uh, had run in the primaries that I thought were, would be better suited for the position because they've had that executive on the ground, you know, with budgets and so forth and actually interacting with constituents in a much different way than some of the others uh, who had been um, moved forward. Uh, Tim Waltz is one I, uh, I co-chair the Council of Governors with him. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, um, I, I can't say that I know him well, um, but we've had a good relationship uh, with, uh, with this co-chair, uh, co-chairing opportunity. And um, he, uh, he speaks his mind. He's been very respectful and civil. Uh, I appreciate that he served in the military and the National Guard for 24 years and uh, as well as his experience as governor. So I think um, he's a great pick for that ticket. What do you make of his politics? 
Well, that's where we may differ a bit. Um, you, you know, some things that I, I agree with him on, and others uh, we may not uh, may not not agree uh, totally. So, uh, but that goes uh, for almost any candidate. Looks like we have one more question on the phone. Uh, Tim McQuiston, Vermont businessman. Hi, Governor. Um, I'm wondering if your thoughts about the the net, next budget process has changed at all since the stock market has suffered. It's, it's rebounded a little bit this week, but I'm wondering about your thoughts about the economy in general and about your your thoughts going forward on, on the Vermont economy. You know, as you know, Tim, I, um, I've taken a cautious approach uh, to uh, the budgetary process. I, I do believe that uh, we are going to have some challenges in the future, uh, that what we've seen in terms of revenues uh, for the state have been based on somewhat uh, of the emergencies uh, that we've seen over the last few years and the influx of, of uh, federal dollars. And I think that that's giving us a false sense of security and actually has driven a lot of um, some of the surpluses we've been seeing. Uh, over the last few years. So uh, that money is drying up, uh, and I think that uh, we should pay attention and be as frugal as possible with, uh, with the budgets that we're putting forward. But inflation has impacted all of us, uh, state government, uh, uh, health care, education, doesn't matter what it is, inflation has had an effect on every single sector. Uh, but we need to, to rein that in and make sure that we're frugal and as conservative as possible in, in budgeting for the next fiscal year. It would that be unprecedented to bring the e-board back um, and reset the, the revenue projections uh, for the coming year? Any, any thought that that's, that, you know, that you might do that or might have to do that? Well, we'll, we'll go on our normal cycle and, uh, and reflect on that as we go. I, I would consider any surplus, any upgrades uh, the emergency board makes as, um, as one-time money, uh, not ongoing uh, revenue. So if we can all keep that in mind, I think that that would go a long ways to, uh, to presenting a budget and, uh, and having the legislature um, reflect on what that really means. One-time money is an ongoing money, and I don't believe what we're seeing right now is, is ongoing. Great. Thank you very much. Back to the room. Uh, back to the race for lieutenant governor and at risk of bringing up my own reporting from earlier this week, but I'm wondering if you were aware that the House Speaker issued verbal and written reprimands to the lieutenant governor last year. I didn't know about the details. Um, I knew that there was uh, the Speaker had had uh, given me a, a heads up that there was some issue, but didn't go into any any details whatsoever. Um, so I wasn't, I can't say that I was surprised, but um, but at the same time, I, I had no knowledge of what was happening. And she was taking this on herself, and said they, her and the, uh, oh, well, actually her and the pro tem were going to address it. When you say, you can't say you're surprised, what do you mean? Well, because I knew that there was some issue, okay. but I didn't know what it was. Okay, you didn't know the nature of it. I all did not. Whatsoever. What do you no think details. of the, the behavior of that? Um, you know, I, I give great credit to the speaker for taking this on and protecting her members. Um, it is a, a unique um, position, being lieutenant governor. You're not really part of of any, I mean, you, you get paid through the executive branch, but you're not a, a part of the executive branch. You're a constitutional officer, um, so there's not a great deal of oversight. And that goes for any constitutional office, whether it's the auditor, secretary of state, treasurer, attorney general, they're all constitutional offices. Do you think that should change? Should there be reforms to create more oversight over those positions? I'm sure there, there could be not, not just this position, but um, you're only accountable to the, the people, uh, those who voted uh, for you. Um, there should be probably some ethics oversight of some sort, um, but uh, maybe that will be taken up in the next session. All right, thank you all very much. Stay safe.